hello um so just links here um this is a video uh about well one of the considering uh most influential philosophers uh of capitalist society as far as we know of today uh by the name of john locke as of course in the title the father of capitalist political ideology um he is very much one of the most influential and the biggest philosophers and in influence of liberal ideas and capitalist distribution uh as well um he very much uh was considerably radical in his time of feudalism or entirely the early uh crackdowns and takedowns of feudalism in his time uh and what we can understand here is that um he is one of the key philosophers for the influence of the political transition and also the distribution aspect of the economic transformation uh from feudalism to capitalism uh and what we can understand from him is very much the uh essence of the uh of the of of uh of what we can understand here is very much he is one of the key influencers uh for capitalism and its entire political ideology as well as yeah its philosophy this is very much important to understand uh, I wanted to preface this, you know, to make sure, uh, I guess for people like to know, I do not openly agree with John Locke on everything. I, I just think it's very much important to um, understand capitalist thinkers and understand the key thinkers of, of liberals uh, and capitalists of who they look to and to critique them and to understand them as, and as well as to critique them as well as this video is going to be prevalent with uh, critiques and criticisms of John Locke and his entire uh, philosophical, um, I guess, idea and as well as his economical, um, I guess, ideas as well. So I wanted to preface that when I, when I, you, when I will look at this video, this is not me praising John Locke. This is me analyzing him and even in some cases even critiquing him uh, so that way we can better understand the uh, the logic of liberals and the logic of capitalists and to better uh, well criticize them and criticize their entire ide uh, ideology. Now, without further ado, let's get started. John Locke was a 17th century philosopher. He was one of the biggest philosophers for the influence of the liberal ideas and early frameworks of capitalist distribution systems to be around, as well as he was one of the, as he made one of the key four tenets and statements of his philosophy and political theory, as well as how individuals should act in our world uh, to, and see a better society, society, supposedly, from the interpretation of his life and thinking as well. Locke was born into a small and summer in, in Somerset Village. He was 10 years old uh, when the English Revolution Civil War uh, broke out, and his father became a captain of the Parliamentary Army. Uh, of the Parliamentary Army, King Charles I was publicly executed uh, in 1649, uh, just a few feet away from where John Locke was studying in a library at Westminster School. He looked over the window and saw uh, the head taken off, uh, like in his words. A cantaloupe or apple being cut into slices by a chef. Mixed with this, uh, with the screams of the crowd and his and his peers, this event would mark him very, very deeply. Later in his life, he planned to be a doctor, but his life changed immensely when, when by chance, he met an acquainting and dashing, uh, yet not so popular, politician Anton Ashley Cooper, 1st Earl of Shaftesbury. Who came to Oxford to find to find a cure for a liver disease he had? Cooper invited Locke to come live with him in London. Locke accepted. Uh, once part of Cooper's life and his friends, he would then go to political debates, philosophy, and religion. Along the way, he managed to cure Cooper of his liver complaint, earning his long life gratitude. Let's start off with one of the most. Uh, let's start off with like the very first uh, thing that he would that he would uh, write. Uh, was the toleration of religious ideas. The one thing that people around the world was questioning was uh, what about to do uh, what to do about religion or more specifically what to do with people who disagree with your religious views. There is many reasons why people would ask this question at the time but let's go to the spark uh, that was very very much prominent uh, to asking this question and breaking away with the Catholic Church. 
uh, under Henry VIII uh, in the 16th century, English Protestants had asked questions over and over again of the importance of religion and the conflicts between them that could not that could now be easily stopped. Because of this, uh, was because of this, it was threat threatening to get out of hand, and there were arguments uh, that there should be total monarch control. Uh, and government control on the church and hard crackdowns on dissenters. John Locke was very much different. He was the advocate of freedom of belief in his book, Toleration, where he advocated for toleration on the basis of religion and differences of three points. Firstly, because earthly judges, the state in particular, and human beings in general cannot dependently evaluate the truth claims of competing religious standpoints. Secondly, even if they could, enforcing a single true religion would not work because you cannot be compelled into a belief through violence. Finally, concerning religious un uh, uniformity leads to, the more, leads to the more social disorder than allowing diversity. John Locke, Intoleration. It's clear here, Locke argues that, uh, that we just have to focus on the quiet and normal state of relaxation. And it has nothing to do with the good of men's souls. To John Locke, religion was a personal choice, and churches were voluntary institutions, to institutions which uh, to him sets their own rules and their and to be left with to it. Thanks to him, locking up people for their religious beliefs was uh, quickly and thoroughly negated. Although I disagree with what he's trying to say about the church. I am one for people to believe in whatever religion they desire. However, the church is not a voluntary institution. It has profited and facilitated capital from the exchange of commodities that furthered more of their institution to be around, to be around while making a, a labor aristocracy with employers over their workers. Thus, they themselves get profit from the labor time workers perform only to put their faith into an abstraction rather than ourselves into humanity. Let's start off with the uh, second uh, thing that he that he talked about, and that is the state. Who should be in charge, and how? Of course, we know John Locke didn't stop at religion. For a long time, he had doubled. He had uh, doubted the monarchy and the remains of the landlords ruling over the peasantry. So, in his work, the two treatises of government tries to answer the question on who should be in charge of the state and how it should be formed and what legitimate and on what legitimate basis. In his work, he calls the takeaway of power of the monarchy and rather putting it to the powers of the parliament and having monarchy act as a figure of symbolism for the country. Or, if the people so desire, ridding the monarchy and having the parliament and prime minister appointed, uh, being the head of the symbol of the country themselves. This would have people uh, chose, uh, be chosen among the population to be appointed by districts of their local governments and as well to be appointed and chosen uh, for the population to vote for their representatives being tallied up and shown and to be appointed voters called electors uh, to then look at the population vote and then either vote for what the people uh, want or, or not and to just vote for who they want. Then, once the representatives have been elected by the electors, uh, they would vote for who should be the prime minister of the country. This is how elections work in the United Kingdoms, Norway, Denmark, and more, and, and countries similar uh, in the United States, France, Germany, and more today. Who are these electors? Well, usually at the time, Locke proposed them to be merchants and shopkeepers, which evolves to the formation of employers, businessmen, and rich people who own people's means of production. In other words, this wasn't a democracy. This is technically just a form of government, not for the landlords for, uh, or for employees, rather one for merchants and shopkeepers to act as a political transition from a monarchy to what can only be explained as a bourgeois democracy. In other words, a, a democracy for people who have the social relation owning other people's means of production, which in our context would really be considered as a bureaucracy or bureaucratic. Thus, in this stance, uh, what a state is in the understanding in our modern context is an authority of a ruling class over a non-ruling class to sustain the class interests of the ruling class and making legislation, laws, 
uh, law enforcement, justice, and institution of violence, and in the substitute uh, of the non-ruling class of what would what would have very different class interests and would seek a new society out of, out of the one uh, they do not control into another. Uh, they can control or they can control or in this instance in today where people can freely associate to their own labor uh, out of the society where we are where we are uh, not reliant uh, to the market. One thing, however, was the outlook of the time uh, was the political authority derived from God, choosing who uh, to become king. But more recent explanation from a philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, uh, had asserted that the, to that the totalitarian power of kings was justified by their ability to keep order and prevent repetition of the chaos that had, rain that had, raided, that had reigned Hobbes, had insisted in the time before classes, money, and the state, that he had called the state of nature, or what would be considered as tribalism. By painting the state of nature in the darkest colors, Hobbes had asked his readers to set themselves low expectations of what a decent ruler would be, to him anything better than the state of nature that he painted as chaotic, and that rulers have no time to abide by human rights or freedom of religion. Obviously, Locke very much disagreed with this, and he and he uh, demolished that idea that government was chosen by God and then criticized Hobbes for his idea of the state of nature. Locke agreed with Hobbes that there was a state of nature before and possibly through the overthrow of the state, but he disagreed with what this would look like. John Locke argued that it would have been peaceful and then agreeing to submit to the government uh, had their uh, uh, government, people had therefore not for not fearfully to surrender all their rights. In fact, he advocated that there were an inalienable rights uh, uh, or natural rights that no ruler can try to enforce or take away. Locke insisted that people had voluntarily uh, conceded uh, to have their rights uh, be limited, on but only in so far as it better preserved their rights as well. They couldn't have been expected to give up these rights entirely because that would just defeat the point of joining a society in the first place. If a ruler started to act like a tyrant and unfairly deprived their subjects of their freedom or property, the subjects were then entitled to overthrowing the state and establishing a new state. This is where the founding father, and especially John Adams and George Washington, thought and put into policy the means of the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America. For instance, on this independence, uh, the United Kingdoms, uh, the United Kingdoms of England and Scotland, and the right of the population to bear arms for militias and the overthrow of government, uh, if it becomes tyrannical, a clear Lockean practice that people should have the right and means to overthrow the state. One thing I disagree with Locke here is that he believes that people uh, consent to their rulers and government. This is not in practice today. However, uh, is one thing to consider. If it was up to me and most workers in their class interests, I would not have to be employed and not work under another person. I would hunt in the morning, build computers in the afternoon, criticize after dinner, and write a book on political economy or philosophy in bed without becoming a hunter, computer builder, a critic, economist, or philosopher. But I can't do that because of the material conditions of our society to where I have to apply for a job that pays me a medium of circulation uh, used to be exchanged for commodities that has my acceptance to be determined by another person. A, a, the sa that same person deciding how long I work, what I use, how I do it, where I do it, and how long. Only me having to demand for better conditions after I've been employed for a certain amount of time through the institutions of unions. Then I can be able to get released and get paid a wage that cuts the amount of labor time performed into the workday to pay the cost of production and needs of my employer, all decided by my employer alone. Then to go to the market and pay for the things that, that I can get with the money that I have, uh, but not be able to buy my entire needs for I have other things to pay and, and, and or just simply uh, not have enough money to do so. Then I go home and feel alienated from my own labor and production and not seek uh, to produce more or be productive. Rather, just relax and seek a way out of the society. 
one thing that was questioned at this time was the right of private property or rental property. Rental property in this instance would be land owned and appointed uh, owners would would own the land and have people produce grains and have and have be taken by landlords uh, in order to be given to the king uh, of uh, of the king uh, to have equivalent of some form of wealth and have the food be redistributed to the peasantry. In contrast, in this instance, private property is land or property that is bought for uh, for private production to have owners uh, of property to employ workers to work on their pro on their property and produce commodities in which the private property owner or employer uh, would take that commodity and sell it into the market, then pay with the money they have for their needs, cost of production, materials, uh, tools, advertising, investment, debt, etc., then pay their workforce a wage that can be lessened from the from the workers based on the amount of workforce uh, they have or how much money they have. In fact, actually both. Locke believed into the latter. He thought that this would uh, give people more freedom and education on life, as well as uh, be able to solve the crisis of lacking uh, that was very much prominent in feudalism and slavery by having, Christ, uh, by having a crisis of lacking. This is where I heavily disagree with John Locke, but this is not to say that I am for rental property, rather that I am just for the abolition of private property and the establishment of public property. The reason why, uh, the reason why uh, is the reason why is because again I would have to be dependent to my employer, which would uh, produce, which I would produce a commodity, which would be uh, a product produced for exchange value. Exchange value in this instance is, uh, instance of course, is self-explanatory. Would be a value that means and outcomes of the process of for exchange, means of exchange and outcome of exchange. Thus. Uh, thus takes labor time that I perform into the materials that are bought from the market and tools used as well uh, as well as the skill I would have producing those commodities, which would be then taken uh, by the employer and sell them into the supply of the market, more based on its demand on its demand, which would have which would have its workers produce more and then uh, competing against its competitors to sell more products, thus trying to sell those products, which would fix the price based on the value lower or higher because because, of course, in the market, products are not guaranteed to be distributed because people have to facilitate a certain value of circulative item, money, to buy the product or which they might have not, which they may or may not have enough money or they're just simply not interested. And because of the competition between one employer and another employer, this would still have the incentive to try and sell those commodities, which would then uh, if considered too old or expired, instead of distributing it uh, to the people that need to be that that need it most, we would waste it. Why? Because there's no money to be gained out of it. Uh, if you just give it, or if you just give it for free, the employer has their own problems as well as their as well has their uh, has to take care of their business and to take care of their needs, also dependent upon the market. So obviously these people aren't evil or bad in a sense. This is just the fact of our economy, but that's exactly the problem. Now mix this with the increasing demand of the market and the forgetfulness of thought in midst of competition between one employer and another, plus with the lack of distribution has the market not being able to sustain the product coming in guaranteed, of course, that, that these would sell in the first place which causes at the end of the day inflation over production lack of distribution and the evolution of companies and now there is a market crash so now investors are having to pull out now employers have to pay debt and then they have to let go a lot of their workers now the workers have no income coming in and then the state has to get involved to bail out companies to keep the system uh, from eating itself and now with the workers not getting income they can't get what they need and everybody is basically mad at each other. Thus, John Locke here is not exactly wrong that we don't have a crisis that we don't have a crisis over lacking. But one thing for sure, now we have more than uh, but now we have uh, more of a contradiction and problem. Now we have a crisis. Now we have a crisis over abundance. 
which in certain cases is actually worse than times in feudalism, not entirely of course. Thus, because of this, although we are more than supplied to feed our population when this happens, we still don't because of how things are distributed in capitalism. Also, another thing which is very much easy to say that you, which is very much easy to say, you can give a kid as much education as possible how to code and write scripts for computers, but that doesn't automatically mean that then the kid can act on that education if they don't have the means to do so. Like how one can be taught to run a business like me, for example, and how the economy works and how to get involved. But that doesn't automatically mean that I have the means uh, to act on me running a business or me influencing the market. And you can't expect everyone to be an employer or business or business person because then how would then how would they get the workforce if everybody is their own business? And if that happens and assuming it solves itself out, which it most likely won't then how would you keep up with the demand of the market against your competitors if you are trying to make as much profit as humanly possible? For the latter question, you can answer uh, a buyout of the competitor, but then that itself creates a workforce. This is, of course, where uh, the philosophy, the logic, and the political ideology and the economical thinking of capitalists, and especially John Locke here, and as well as Adam Smith, is very is very much limited because you can't expect everyone to be an employer because that would not create a workforce, as we pointed out. And you can buy out a competitor, sure, but that in itself creates a workforce. You know, you know, this is where. The limits of capitalism and the capitalist logic of capitalists um, is is very much limited and does not essentially answer this question, does not think about this. So, yeah. Anyways, let's continue. Now, let's start off with the final thing that he would talk about is the – and the most influential thing that he would talk about for sure is the question of educating our children. In his book, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, this is possibly one of the most influential contributions uh, John Locke has made. In, in 1684, an aristocrat called Edward Clark asked Locke for advice on raising his son and heir. Although Locke was uh, unmarried and never had kids and by all accounts didn't really like children, Locke responded regardless with a series of letters that he eventually turned into a book. Locke began by saying that all of us start with start off in life with minds that are blank. Tabula rasi, he calls. He calls it in another work called Essay of Human Understanding. The idea uh, runs contrary that our minds are, fit, are fitted at birth and all sorts of ideas about religion, ethics, morality, and government. Locke argued that everything we think, believe, know, or conjugate or conject uh, is actually derived from from experience, from the simple ideas of the sensations uh, we see in the outside world, or internal reflections of the processes of our own understandings. According to Locke, education was absolutely crucial to how people turn out. I think I may say that all the men we meet with nine parts of ten are what they are what they are good or evil, useful or not, because of education. John Locke, Essay of Human Understanding. Locke believed that we are very vulnerable of the ideas that people will place in our minds when we are children. He wrote the little and almost insensible impressions of our tender infancies have very important and lasting consequences. John Locke, Some Thoughts on Concerning Education. He argued that the association of ideas that one makes when someone is young are more important than those made later because they are the foundation of ourselves. So he warned famously not to let a foolish maid convince a child that, do that goblins and spirit and and spirit are associated with the night. Darkness shall forever afterwards bring with it uh, those frightful ideas. Without knowing the common question for parents and basic understanding uh, for them doesn't actually come up on top of their heads. Rather, it is a subconsciously 
an idea from a philosopher that was heavily that heavily influenced our society. Okay, now I think we can essentially conclude on this topic of John Locke. John Locke was far was by far one of the most influential philosophers in our world by parenting to economy, to government, and to religion. He has made a great influence and in change in society and how the world works. The point that I think the very thing of philosophy and what we can understand of this and economy, uh, politics, and all of these understandings, all of this idea, the point of philosophy is not to destroy everything you know about the world, rather to actually is a way for you to become, become more connected with the world and to look at it, to look at it and as well as try to change it this is why i think it's very much important where we understand philosophers have done all they could to interpret the world however the point of it is to change it that's the conclusion that we can bring up here and as well as the fact that we conclude again capitalists are capitalists are very much limited into the logic and they are very much uh in essence uh not exactly thinking uh of the means of that of the means of which one can act on education and as well as the consequences of private property the market distribution system uh, uh capitalist production commodity production etc cetera, etc cetera, on how that actually affects people into society and especially the worker of alienation of exploitation the extraction of surplus value and the furthering uh kind of like uh, the furthering alienation of freedom of what we call unemployment. I think that's very much important to understand here uh, and to essentially uh, drive from that. And as of an appendix to uh, this video, uh, I guess, um, there was a question uh, I saw in my email uh, from a viewer, a commenter uh, in my channel called Yorkshire. Uh, M-G-T-O-W. Oh, God, that fucking name. Jesus Christ, that's so bad. Um, sorry. Um, which he would ask, I believe, or along the lines of, if we were to have a society without money, uh, then how would workers go on holiday? Now, I want to let just let this know that uh, this is another example of what I mean, that capitalists cannot think uh, of the questions that they ask and cannot think about what they are saying uh, before they say it. And especially if we're talking of the context of a moneyless society where there is no market and we've heavily created the conditions where people are not dependent to the market and not dependent of exchange of commodities, that they would still fucking ask that question regardless. So I'm going to answer it with another question if we are to have a moneyless society uh to which people can freely associate with their labor without any dependency to a medium of circulation uh into which they can essentially choose to be whatever they want hunt in the morning build computers in the afternoon uh criticize after dinner uh write write uh, about economics and philosophy in bed without becoming a hunter, a computer builder, a critic, an economist, or philosopher in this society where they freely associate and they can essentially uh, get what they and they can essentially get what they need and the products that they desire uh, from the amount of contribution in society that with like items that proves that like they uh, that they did produce that they did contribute into society. What makes you think? that they don't have the freedom to go on holiday. It makes you think that they don't have the freedom to go see their families and to go uh, help out with their uh, brothers and sisters and their entire family uh, whenever they feel like it. The entire essence, in fact, this entire essence of a moneyless society would actually negate the idea of of vacation in the first place if people can then actually just freely associate with their labor uh and essentially not rely into a market of exchange then you know this negates the essence of yeah the idea of vacation in the first place that you essentially are free like chosen from an employer's like bidding the like when yeah they can freely associate themselves 
as well as the fact that like if it is a moneyless society and we create the conditions where people do not have to rely onto the market and the exchange of commodities then yeah what makes you think that that these people don't have the freedom to just go on holiday based on their own terms this is an example of of an example of capitalists not thinking of what they ask and not thinking of what they understand and they don't actually understand the actual economics of socialism and they always fucking think into the context of capitalism of which we understand of today uh instead of actually understanding the criticisms of of socialists and communists and to the further uh, economical landscape that we have provided uh in a theoretical structure um for socialism as a post-capitalist society uh, anyways yeah uh socialist links here um if you like this video hit the like button down below i'd very much uh, appreciate it if you're new to my channel hit the subscribe button i'd also very much appreciate it and uh yeah if you're new to my channel and you like what i do and you like what i you like what i do then yeah subscribe to the channel and you can basically see all my videos and yeah um thank you for watching and socialist links is out